Okay, so welcome to this next video on the store-operated calcium entry. Now, uh, we are discussing this story right from the start. So we are discussing at the moment how we can activate the GQ pathway uh, via uh, histamine binding to the H1 receptor. Okay, so, uh, so far we've got to the fact that the uh, GQ uh, alpha QGTP subunit will bind and activate the phospholipase C beta enzyme. Now, uh, the phospholipase C beta enzyme breaks down a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer. So, usually in the phospholipid bilayer, you have a molecule known as PIP2, which stands for phosphatidyl in ositol um, uh, 4,5-bisphosphate. So, I'll write that name down and then we'll have a look at the cartoon that I can draw um, to demonstrate it. So, its full name is phosphatidyl phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Uh, 4,5-bisphosphate. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so, people often abbreviate phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate to PIP2. So, the PI stands for phosphatidyl inositol, and then the P2 stands for the fact that you've added two phosphate groups onto it on the fourth and the fifth carbons. Right, so the structure of this then. Well, firstly, what does phosphatidyl mean? Phosphatidyl refers to a phosphatidate molecule. Now, a phosphatidate molecule is just another name for an ordinary phospholipid, i.e. a glycerol molecule bound to two long-chain carboxylic acids. So I'll colour each thing in. These here are long-chain carboxylic acids, or fatty acids, um, which have been esterified to the first and the second hydroxyl group of uh, a glycerol molecule. Okay, so these are fatty acids. Uh, then we have a glycerol molecule. This horizontal line represents the glycerol molecule, or the propane 1, 2, 3 trial, if you're a chemist. So this is glycerol. Okay. And then, off the third hydroxyl group of the glycerol molecule, you then have a little phosphate group. So this is a phosphate group here. Now, that is the structure of a usual phospholipid. And basically, another older name for a normal phospholipid is phosphatidate. So, this at the moment, what I have drawn is phosphatidate. And most, um, most of the, um, most of the, Phospholipid bilayer will be made up of phosphatidate, phosphatidate uh, molecules. Okay, now what we have, what we're talking about is not a phosphatidate molecule. It's a phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate uh, molecule, a PIP2 molecule. Now, we've added this phosphatidyl group onto inositol. Inositol is a 6 membered uh, carbon ring, which has hydroxyl groups coming off every single carbon. So I'll denote that like so. Here's the six-membered carbon ring of inositol. So this here, this inositol, is this bit here of our structure. So the phosphatidyl was this entire phosphatidate bit, which is the structure of a usual uh, phospholipid in the phospholipid bilayer. And we've stuck, basically, an extra bit onto that phospholipid. We've stuck on an inositol group, and we're not finished yet, because we also have stuck on phosphate groups to the fourth and the fifth carbon of inositol. So that creates you a molecule which we can draw cartoonly, like so. Okay. Right, so this is the structure, um, this is the uh, cartoon, my cartoon structure of phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Now, uh, the enzyme phospholipase C beta, basic, and in fact all phospholipase C enzymes, not just the beta type, but we're, in this pathway we're talking about phospholipase C of the beta type. But anyway, this enzyme, what it does is it breaks down these PIP2 molecules, and the way it does that is it breaks this bond here, and let me get a pen to, a coloured pen, it breaks this bond between the third hydroxyl group of the glycerol molecule in green, and uh, this first phosphate group here, which was attached to that glycerol molecule. And what it's going to produce is it's going to produce two molecules by doing that. It's going to produce this um, molecule which consists of these two long-chain carboxylic acids, or 
fatty acids esterified to this glycerol molecule here. So that's a diacylglyceride, that molecule. So this is diacylglyceride, because you have two acyl groups uh, attached to a glyceride, basically, to, well, to a glycerol molecule. So that's where diacylglyceride comes from. And it's often just abbreviated to DAG for short. Right. And the other thing that you get off is you get this inositol molecule here bound to free phosphate groups. So you get uh, this inositol group here bound to free phosphate groups here. One, two, three. Okay, so let me just colour everything nicely in. So this is our inositol um, um, six-membered carbon ring here. And here are uh, phosphate groups which have been added on to these hydroxyl groups off the inositol carbons. So, this molecule here is inositol with uh, free phosphate groups. So, inositol with a phosphate group on the first carbon, a phosphate group on the fourth carbon, and a phosphate group on the fifth carbon. So, inositol 145 trisphosphate. And I don't know why uh, someone chose to name it that. Why they didn't name it, name it inositol 143 for trisphosphate, but long ago someone decided that it was going to be inositol 145 uh, trisphosphate, and that's stuck basically. Okay, so that is what the enzyme phospholipase C beta does. It breaks down PIP2 in the membrane into diacylglyceride or DAG and inositol 145 trisphosphate, which also has an acronym. It's usually denoted I for inositol, and P for phosphate, and free for free phosphates. So in those IP3 is um, the name that people commonly use uh, for this. Now, diacylglyceride has a very interesting role. It goes off and activates protein kinase C, but we're not interested in that. We're interested in the calcium signaling that you get from this pathway. And the calcium signaling is brought about by this IP3 molecule rather than the diacylglyceride molecule. So, we're going to turn over the page and we're only going to care about inositol 145-trisphosphate. Okay, so IP3 has gone up, basically. What does IP3 go and do? Well, basically, um, the um, calcium level in the cytoplasm of a cell is very, very low. So, if this is our cell here, let's say here, calcium in the cytoplasm is very, very low. In fact, the concentration is usually around 100 nanomolar. That is very low. Compare that to the concentration of calcium in the extracellular fluid over here, uh, which is usually around 1.5 millimolar. So more than 10,000 times bigger than this concentration here. Okay, so it's a big concentration gradient across the cell membrane. Now, you do have some calcium inside the cell, but it's not in the cytoplasm. Instead, it is sequestered in the endoplasmic reticulum. So you have quite a high concentration of calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum. And basically, uh, the way this IP3 um, molecule here is going to interact, well, the way it's going to cause a calcium signal within the cytoplasm is that there is a receptor in the ER membrane here for IP3, um, which basically, when it opens, is going to allow calcium to leave uh, the endoplasmic reticulum and go into uh, the uh, cytoplasm, basically. Okay, right. So, um, let's, let's have a look at the way this IP3 receptor here which is often denoted IP3R for IP3 receptor. Let's have a look at how this IP3 receptor functions, right, and how it's and what the effect of IP3 on this receptor is. So basically, if I draw a bigger diagram of this IP3 receptor down here, okay, so this is our larger diagram here. Okay, so the IP3 receptor is a tetramer. It's made up of four separate polypeptides. So one here, two there, three and four there. So it's made up of four quarters, basically. 
okay. And um, in each of these four sockets where you need to put a polypeptide, there are three genes which can code for a protein that you can use, basically. So there are three genes encoding these subunits that you can use to build the IP3 receptor. And basically, you can either make IP3 receptors which are homotetramers, meaning that you take one of these genes and you make the protein corresponding to that gene four times, and you then put those four proteins together to make a tetramer that has four identical subunits, basically. So that's a homotetramer, for the same, obviously. Uh, and uh, the other option is that you can make a heterotetramer, which is where you don't use the identical gene to code for all of the protein's uh, subunits, basically, and you have subunits that are encoded by different genes. So you can also make heterotetramers. Okay, right. And the uh, protein subunits of this IP3 receptor are absolutely massive, is another important fact about it. This is a massive, great protein. Uh, each of the subunits of the IP3 receptor has approximately 2,750 amino acids. That is a huge, great protein. And you are now joining four of these together to make something, you know, that's going to have uh, over 10,000 amino acids comprising it. It's a big structure. Okay, now to the important stuff. How does IP3 affect this IP3 receptor? So... Before IP3 binds to the IP3 receptor, what you have available on each of these IP3 receptor subunits is a calcium binding site that is inhibitory. So this orange dot that I've drawn on each of these subunits of the IP3 receptor, this is an inhibitory calcium binding site, basically. An inhibitory calcium binding site. So, if calcium binds to this uh, inhibitory calcium binding site, then uh, it will inactivate the receptor. It will make the receptor more likely to be closed. Okay? So at the moment, before IP3 has bound, if calcium binds to this receptor, then the receptor will be more likely to uh, close. Okay, so this receptor will always be flicking between the on and the off stage. And if you look at the receptor at any one time, there's a certain probability it will be in the on, uh, in the open conformation, and there's a certain probability it will be in the closed conformation. Now, basically, if calcium binds to this receptor when it's got no IP3 bound, it will increase the probability that when you look at it, it's in the closed state and decrease the probability that when you look at it, it's in the open state. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.